Today, my guest is Scott Bushke from Cornerstone Business Services. Scott has been involved in more than 300 middle market deals and an alliance that he talks about where he's they've completed over 3,282 deals. So welcome, Scott Bushke. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Good. So you got to tell me about these uh, middle market deals, these 300 deals, and then we're going to talk about that alliance, what that exactly is. So tell sure. me a little bit about these 300 deals that you've been working on. Yeah. So I've started in the mergers and acquisition world back in 1998 at the ripe age of 24 when most people get it at 52. So the old saying of ignorance is bliss definitely fit uh, fit this scenario. I, I loved sales. I loved helping people and just kind of fell into this industry by accident and uh, worked for another firm for a couple of years and then started up Cornerstone in 2001 and been doing it ever since for the last uh, you know 20 plus years now. So, uh, but yeah, we worked on the buy side, we worked on the sell side and most of them are in that low middle market space. And a lot of the clients that we work with are in that two to 50 million enterprise value range. And, uh, you know, look all shapes and sizes of different industries. So it's, it's been, uh, you know, we've seen deals get done in less than two months and we've seen deals take over two and a half years. Uh, we, we've had deals that were easy. When I say the word easy is very loosely, you kind of everything flowed well and there's deals that blew up the day before closing. So it, it's, uh, it's a very interesting time. And, you know, to be a buyer out there, it's, uh, you know, we, we talk about it being, a much safer way to buy a company versus starting a company because starting a company, all you have is an idea and you might think it's the best idea in the world, but it might not might work. It might not work. And you don't know when you're going to be able to take any income out of the business or, or that first salary where if you buy a company and you structure it right, you know, you've got a company that's got a proven track record. It's got, you know, trained employees. It's got revenue coming in. It's got cash flow dropping to the bottom line. And you should be able to take a, a paycheck day one. And then hopefully, obviously, build the company up uh, from there. But uh, happy to talk about any specific now, questions that you have. So I'm going to come from this as if I have a company. It's doing $10 million top line and maybe, let's say, $2 million bottom line. It's pretty profitable, really good company, family-owned business. And it's I can't get anybody to my son's daughter's take over. Uh, so I got to sell this. Uh, so... Why would you be interested in my company? Why would I, uh, you know, I'm in a, I'm in this manufacturing niche. Why are you interested in my company? Yeah, I, I would say first it's it's your cash flow. You know, a two million in EBITDA that happens to be, you know, there, there's different types of buyers out there. There's obviously public companies that we all know about. Then there's private buyers, pri private companies that are looking to grow through acquisition. But then you also have the financial buyers, which are private equity firms and family offices. And those last two category. Private equity has really been the, the train driving this huge M and A marketplace. It's a great time to be a seller right now for most most industries, and their break point for a lot of deals is two million in EBITDA. So if you can get to two million EBITDA or above, you it kind of the, the market opens up. Another layer of market opens up. Another layer of buyers opens up. So, uh, so you're not just going after companies that are already do manufacturing. You're you're addressing the six thousand private equity firms chasing this lower middle market middle market correct yeah so we we had a, a deal that i i did not too long ago and we had 28 different buyers uh on on one company doing about uh four million in ebitda uh and that was the buyers were family offices private equity firms esops private companies there's no public companies but it was yeah we go after everybody and it really depends too on what you know you as the seller what are you looking for you know if you're looking to you know, maximize the value, get a, get 100%, you know, sell 100% of the company and get out sooner rather than later. Well, that's probably a playbook more for a strategic buyer or a company that's already, you know, looking to grow vertically or horizontally. If you're going, hey, you know what? I, boy, it's a really good time to sell. I'm not ready to retire yet. I've still got some, some energy, but boy, it'd be nice to take some chips off the table now in this great marketplace. Yeah. So maybe I'll sell 70 or 80% of my company. And then I'll roll 20% into new co for another five years or so. That's a great play for a private equity firm. So, you know, what we'll do is we'll sit down with you as a seller. And actually, we've created a workbook that we have a lot of our clients, potential clients go through. And one of them is what's most important to you. And again, there's no right or wrong answers, but the more you can hone in on what's important to you, the better chance someone like us as, as your eminent advisor or investment banker will have of getting you, you know, more of what you're looking for and allow you to go out more on, uh, on your terms.
Hey, I got a, there's a reputation for private equity firms to sign an LOI at one price and then work on moving it down the price out because, you know, they start pissing on the couch that, hey, there's a den in that guy, you know, right there. It, so I, I'm taking it. Your job is to keep that original price. <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and even before that is to vet the buyers because you're, you're absolutely right. There are some, like any industry, there are really good people and good ethical people. And then there's just sharks. And the problem is for the average owner or even average advisor, it's really hard to tell the difference between the, each of them because they go to their websites. They all look the same. They all talk the same. They all promise the same. It's who actually delivers on that or not. So, yeah, when, when we get into – so last year we averaged uh, nine offers or indications of interest per client. So taking it from nine and narrowing it down to three to five, that's what we're doing. We're looking at, you know, cult, you know we're looking at vetting them of what is it, what's their culture, what's their MO, you know, talking to past sellers. The nice thing about private equity is most of them bought other companies before. So you can track down, sometimes you can either track them down or they'll give you the owner's names and you can give them a call and say, hey, how, you know, you're not going to talk about what the multiple was or things like that, but how did they, did they close on time? Did they do what they said they're going to do? Did they try to retrade the deal at the 11th and a half hour? Um, what did they do after the sale? Did they give you the support that they said they were going to give you? Are they, you know, micromanaging you or are they letting you run the business day to day? So we can really, you know, they've got their tricks and we've got ours to, to really make sure that we as best as we can get those buyers out that are just looking to, yeah, you know, get, get you excited and, and then retrade the deal down the road. And that's why, you know, the scary part is, is that with the record amount of money that's sitting out there right now in the marketplace, I mean, just last year, private equity raised over $900 billion, you know, what is it, that? Is, that, is it, it five trillion or is one trillion or something? They, they raised every? 900 billion and spent a trillion last year records. I think on both fronts, you know, and you think, so if they raise a $900 billion, they're going to spend that money in the next probably five years. You know, and, 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 and there's just so much dry powder out there right now. But what they're, uh, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to spend a bunch of time and money and, and resources to get to you, the business owner, John, before John comes to Scott, the investment banker, because they know if I can get to you one-on-one -on -one direct, I'm going to get a much better deal. And that's what, you know, a lot of times they'll, they can, they'll get you, they'll get you excited, sign an LOI. And once they got you exclusive, now, now they've got to got you because now they can drag things out. Oh yeah, hey, I got to do a QOV. Yeah, I was supposed to take two, you know, thirty days. We're out ninety days now, and it's taking longer. And they just keep asking for more and having you take your eye off the ball. And they're just waiting for, you know, for your your numbers to just take a little bit or, or just have some kind of a slip on anything. And they go, oh hey, wait, you know, your trend is going down now. We you know, we got to look at this. It was going up, but now it's going down. So we're still paid the six multiple, but it's not it. Four million and EBITDA. Now it's at three five, and, and you're taking the hit on the on the. Yeah, difference. and that's by that time they have this exclusive on this LOI, and they feel like, oh my god, uh, I either back out or I just go with the deal, and, and take it. Yeah. You know, so talking at the dinner table with the wife, so like take it, not take it. And like just take it. We're tired. Yeah, yeah and, and that's what happens is they, you know, and again, not all of them. There's some really good. Yeah, no, I'm not just saying like yeah. there's the reputation that's formed around that. Yeah. But, but it absolutely is. It's, it's, so that's why when you get in that one-on-one, -on -one, they control the process, they control the time frame, and they're going to close when they want to close. And, yeah, they, a lot of times they'll want to wear you down and then go, hey, we can close in a week at $15 million. Yeah, we're going to give you $20 million. We can close in a week at 14 or we'll just cancel this. We'll, we'll, you know, and now you've already, as a seller, you and your, your spouse have – I already thought of maybe plan the trip and you started thinking about where you're going to spend the money and everything else. You go, man, I'm a week away from this or I got to start back at square one. And it's not even square one. It's almost negative one because you've taken your eye off the ball and you're emotionally now excited. And now you just are deflated and you got to go back and either find a different buyer or just go back to work it every day, which is, is tough. Just once you get curious uh, with a trillion spent 900 billion raised over the next five years, and this herd mentality, fear of missing out, and six thousand people chasing this like small amount of deals. Are they overpaying? Yeah, you know the market will determine the rate, but they are the multiples now are higher than they've been uh, in a long time. And, and it, it, even with it's crazy. If you would have said, "Hey, Scott, you know you've got twenty years of experience, and there's going to be this thing called COVID that's going to shut down the country. You're going to have supply chain issues. You're going to have employee shortage. You're going to have inflation." What do you think the M&A market is going to look like? I'd be like, it's going to look like 2008, nine. You know, it's going to be, it's going to slow down. There's going to be less deals. 
but deal volume's going to come down, and it just hasn't. You know, there's so, again, there's so much money. A company has a bunch. They all have strong balance sheets too, for the most part. But they can go, hey, there's too many uncertainties. We're going to hold off today. We'll just focus organically for this year. But with private equity, when they raise that capital, they got ten years to find a company, buy it, grow it, and sell it within that ten year window. So that's where. The number, the values are, are high. And to give you an example, there's a, a group out there called GF Data, and they've been uh, reporting on low middle market and middle market companies for, uh, I think since 2003 on a quarterly basis. They have over 200 private equity firms that will send in their deals, and it's really good data. But they, so every year, every quarter since 2003, and I think it was Q3 and Q4 of 2021 were the highest multiples they've ever seen in their 16, 17 year history. Wow. So, yeah, so multiples are extremely high. We're trying to get as that, many sellers. It, it, yeah, that's just too many people chasing the same deals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at it, you've got more money than you've ever had. You've got more buyers. You've got a limited quality of, limited amount of good quality deals. Sell, you know, baby boomers are still hanging on. Yeah. You've got low interest rates. They're, they're rising, but they're still relatively low. And you've got debt available because corporations, you know, I know a ton of low middle market companies that used to work out of a line of credit. And we did as well. Going, hey, that's smart. You know, you don't use your own equity. You use a line of credit as you need it. Well, then, you know, then 2008 hit, and good companies all of a sudden had banks calling their notes, going, hey, you know, you gotta, you got, you know, you're a service company. You don't have any assets to back up this line of credit. You got to pay it down. And they're like, wait a second. So now, a lot of people are working out of reserves, cash reserves instead of lines. So these banks are going, hey, we gotta, we gotta get rid of this money. We gotta earn some money here. So they're going to all their good customers, going, John. You've been a customer of our bank for you know 15 years. You're your smart business owner. Please go buy something. Go add something onto your business. What can we do to get this money? <laughs> grow, grow. Yeah, go grow, yeah. Please, yeah. So it's yeah. so you got a lot of money, a lot of debt, and more buyers and sellers. It's kind of econ 101. The sellers, you know, just yeah, yeah. It. That's it. We see what happens there. Um, what is the kind of the balance of the ratio of the, the companies that you sell to private equity, family office versus selling to another manufacturer oh, in the same yeah. market? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's over the last five years, it's grown uh, to be more private equity than uh, than strategic. It used to be maybe 70, 30, you know, a, a company and then 30 percent private equity. But the last couple of deals that we've done, um, we had one done in Atlanta that was we had three offers. It was in uh, two or strategic buyers. It was just a perfect fit for them. It could slide it right in much bigger, could absorb everything in. What kind of company it, was that? What kind of did? It? it was uh, in the construction space. They did, um, but it was a distribution company. They had technology uh, that, uh, what was the name of the company? Uh, the, the product that basically it was something you'd add to like a front end loader or a dozer and things like that. Some technology, part of like a John Deere dozer. But uh, so they were, they were a, a value add distributor. And we had two offers that came in right around 5 million plus or minus were the two strategics. Five million was it uh, 60, 70 percent down, or five million total? A uh, five million purchase price, cash at close. Yeah, and uh, and then we had another, and then we had a private equity group that came in that focused on kind of industrials and and things along that line, but they came in at eight and a half million. So I had two two strategic buyers, privately held companies at five. Another group came in at eight and a half million, and and they obviously ended up buying the company. They the owner rolled ten percent in the new co. Uh, his number two guy became the CEO, and it's going extremely well. And they're growing. They added. They've already added a whole other state territory and and everything else with their with their. Uh, wow, back. I mean that's a pretty big difference between the three offers. Right, and yeah. then we've had we, we had another one that we just did. Well, what was the justification for that? I don't know, like uh, from five million. I mean, you've got these analysts going, "Hey, we think the valuation is five million, and comps are five million. People are selling for five million, but then it comes in at eight million. Because they could or they could add that to their pipeline, and then in, make up that money in a short period of time. Yeah, I, I think the, two things. Number one, sometimes these strategics that are bigger going, hey, you know, John, I'm doing twenty million. Yeah, I'm doing fifty million. You're doing ten. What am I going to get by buying you? I'm so much smarter than you are. So they go, here, here's an offer, and it's not, it's not necessarily a great offer. It's a, it's a decent offer, but they don't really. I think sometimes ego gets in the way. They don't offer up a. a, a a, a, a premium or a good price, so they pay, they pay our fair price, and then these private equity goes, hey, these numbers work. They saw where they they understood, they studied the market, they knew where they how they could grow the business, 
And so it just wasn't going to be status quo, just absorb us in and, you know, we're kind of just a division of big company. Now they were going to take this as a platform and build upon it, and they have. They've done very well, and, and it'll be a good return for them from everything they've done, you know, so far. Um, we just had another company that we sold a month ago, and it was 14 different offers. And the uh, 14 different offers. Yeah, 14 different offers. And this was in the art supply business, so they supplied art supplies. So they had a you know, they had a COVID bump a little bit, you know, with obviously everybody being home, and but it's it's kept on going, and, and they do they did a lot of different things. And uh, I forget what the range was, but it was a pretty pretty big range. And we thought that was uh, it e-commerce or distribution or what was it? Some e-commerce and, and, and a lot into different stores and schools and things like like that as well. Oh, okay. But they, explain uh, your uh, your fee structure, buy side, sell side. How does that work for somebody coming to you? I'm like, hey, I got this uh, ten million dollar company, two million EBITDA. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it depends obviously on the size, but yeah, I'll give you an example. So the first thing that we do is what we call our EOV or estimate of value. So where some people will say, hey, John, what do you what do you think it's worth? Ten million bucks. All right, great. Let's let's jump in together. Here's my contract. Sign it up. Pay me fifty thousand dollars up front, and let's see what happens. And then you know, it's but it's not worth ten. You think it's worth ten? Maybe it's really worth seven. And now we spend a year, you know, bringing you offers at five, six, and seven. And I'm trying to convince you to do it at seven versus the ten number that we set up. And everybody, nobody's happy at the end of the day. So we do just kind of a walk before you run. So we'll we we charge uh, twenty nine hundred dollars, so less than three grand, to do what we call our EOV. It takes about three weeks, two to three weeks, and we get the financials. We'll recast everything. We'll study the industry, study their company and trends, and then we look at other privately held companies that sold of similar size and scope over the last several years to try to get understanding. And then with this network, that the alliance that we built up, we could also talk to other people that are industry experts or, or specialists have done work in that space and go, hey, what's really going on in the space today? And uh, so when we bring that together, it really helps them get, uh, you know, baseball analogy, this is a single or double, not, you know, the grand slam that if everything lines up, this is what we could maybe get. So if we say, hey, you know, we think it's 10 million, does that match up with your expectations? So one thing that we do is we'll do that estimate of value. And then we also recommend that they meet with their CPA to go, okay, who cares if it's 10? You know, what do you, John, what are you going to net out of this thing? Yeah, you yeah. Know, oh, I'm going to net out six. Okay, great. Well, again, you don't know what that's going to do for you. So then we have you meet with your financial advisor or introduce you to one and say, okay, I'm going to net out six. You sit down here. Here's the lifestyle I want to live. Here's the assets I have now. Here's the debt I have now. This is what I want to do. And, you know, what's that? We call it the lifestyle number. What's that lifestyle number or what's that wealth gap? And if it's anything less than six, hey, Great, you can do what you want to do. But seven, well, then you got to decide: do I want to lower my lifestyle, uh, or do I want to, you know, go back and work on the business for a little bit, and build more value? So that's kind of our process. And then that's just so that's you stand alone. We do that, and then if that makes sense, then we're again we're most investment banks that have the closing ratios of you know around ninety percent that we do. We'll charge forty to one hundred fifty thousand up front. We charge five grand up front, and then five grand a month for six months right now, and then credit that credit that back against the success, the success fee. And if it's a $10 million deal, um, you know, we're probably somewhere around 5% or, or, or plus or minus. And what we're, we're a little bit different, too, is that a lot of groups will start, and again, no right or wrong, just different philosophies, and go, all right, it's a $10 million deal. I'm going to charge you 10% on the first $2 million, then 8% on the next two, and then eight, six, you know, four, and, and down to two. So they're making their highest percentage on the first dollar. We like to say, hey, if, if market's five, maybe we're at 4.5 4. or 4.85. And then after 10, if we hit, once we hit 10 million, everything above that, now that's at six and a half percent. So we make our highest percentage on the backside. So if we do hit that home run or grand slam, then we both share, you know, a little bit more. in, in that Yeah, situation. so a bigger pool of information to go on this alliance. Tell me about this alliance, because uh, what what is it? Um, what, what what kind of value does it create from it? Yeah, so I, I've been the... Uh, I've been involved in associate many associations since I started 24 years ago. So there's the International Business Broker Association, which is about 2,500 members, and they focus on more Main Street related companies, kind of zero to two million. And then they they were they've been around for a long time, and then they built out of that came a sister brand called the MA Source, and that's more the low middle market kind of the you know where where IBBA stops at two million, they kind of go two to fifty million enterprise value. So those are the two groups. Well, I've, I've been the chair of both of those groups and been on their boards and things like that for a lot of years. And one thing that I always saw was that, you know, you go to these conferences for two and a half days or five days and man, like, 
man, those were the best two and a half days of my life. You know, we, we all, we take some classes, you know, we, we learn to listen to some instructors, but then it's a lot of it's around the bar, around the dinner table. Hey, John, how did you do this? Or, hey, Scott, what, you know, how did you handle this scenario? You know, and you, it's all the best practice shared for people all over the world. And I said, boy, we should, we should try to capture that more. And, but it wasn't the model of the association. Like, hey, we, we do two conferences a year or one conference a year. And this is, that's what we do. And we've got some other things. So I said, wouldn't it be great if we could kind of capture that secret sauce and do it on a more consistent basis? But not only with just anybody that's just willing to write a check to be part of the association, let's try to get the best of the best together. So we looked around and said, you know, the lower middle market is two to 50 enterprise value. It's the most underserved marketplace out there because you've got a ton of business brokers and commercial real estate working with the business, with those main street businesses. And then the bigger investment banks come in at, you know, they don't get out of bed for a million dollar fee or more. So that's where, you know, that, that's where that space is. And it's usually a lot of, I think over 50% are one person shows or one person shops. And I said, could, what if we could find the best of the best to bring them together and create some scale if, to serve these lower the market clients? So that's what we set out to do is it started in 2018. We're up to, uh, I think 28 member firms, over 80 individual, 80 MA advisors within the, within the 28 firms. And the whole goal is to provide our clients with uh, with more tools and resources, so we can instead of everybody buying a tool, a resource at retail, we can buy it at wholesale or get one better pricing for it. So we have more tools and resources for all of our members than they would have individually. So like like what resources? Like deal materials or something, or or what? Yeah, research tools like uh, uh, GF Data or PitchBook or uh, DB Hoover's. You know, be able to do research on who are the best buyers for our our seller clients or. Industry reports, uh, uh, Ibis World, and things along that line. To really okay, okay. Help yeah. us, you know, put together better books, or understand industries better, or be able to search and bring all the buyers to the table. You know, not not miss a segment. Uh, p- private equity info. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, so tools. It's it's to bring together uh, from a geographic standpoint. You know, if we want to do cross border deals, or if we think there's a buyer you know, from Wisconsin, you know, a, a buyer should come from California. We've got people in Cal- We got people in like 27 different states. With offices, because some have multiple states. We had people up in Canada, and we got people overseas. We just we just brought somebody out in Brazil, so we can do as we continue to build this out. We'll have it'll be easier to do cross border deals. But then the biggest two also are you get access to industry experts. So if John, you know, you come to me and say, hey, you know, I've got this niche manufacturing company. I want you to sell that. I've been re- referred to you. How many have you done? Well, I've, yeah, I've done a few over the years, but I've got my partner in you know Pennsylvania that's done thirty of them. You know, I'll bring him in at some level. And so you're going to get me and all of my team. You're going to get an industry expert. And so, so you get, you get better, better chances. How does, uh, how do you split the commission on that? Does he come in kind of like a real estate, like three and three or something? No, it's, it's different. It's proprietary how we split it up, but it, it's, it, it's what the client, the client's not going to pay any more. The client knows that I pay one fee to Cornerstone Business Services and I get access to this whole, this whole alliance. And we, then we, the biggest thing that we do then is every single month, Share best practices. So the the principals get together and talk about best practices. The advisors get together. The MA advisors get together. There aren't the owners to talk. The admin people, you know, so you might be an executive assistant, you might be a director of operations, but they have no one to talk to about what they do or how they run their office. So they get together and the valuation people also get together. So it's it's just this great collaboration of people that all want to learn from each other and share. And we all get better together. So our, our theme is that, you know, we're all better together than we are individually and, and that's about uh, deal flow you say hey i'm, I'm going to try to get as much attention and uh uh you know around this deal i just signed up and yeah, they say oh yeah. man i got this great relationship with this family office yeah yeah exactly so what, what we'll do is everybody sends their deals to nick olson's our, our managing director here in green bay and, and uh, so everybody sends their deals into nick and then nick puts together uh one email that goes out to, to a blast goes out to everybody in our in our network going hey here are the new buy side mandates sell side you know engagements if you know of anybody you know give give your partner one of your partners a call so it's a great way to yeah just get more eyeballs on things share and get access to those industry experts and all, it, it, the reason i set it up is it's all better because we can bring more value to our clients you know it's because we've lost some deals where it was a $35 million transaction. They end up going with a large regional uh, CPA firm. And like, well, we went with them because they're larger. Well, they have 400 employees, but only five of them worked in M&A. You know, they just had a big company. 
and, or they talked about all the deals they did, you know, between all the different offices. So that's where we can aggregate our stats as well. To say, hey, we've done over 3,000 deals as, as, as a group. You know, we've sat in your shoes. We've all owned companies as well. In fact, we have over a thousand hour or thousand years of business ownership experience. We've got over 1,200 years of M&A experience between the groups. And that's just going to continue to build. So it's, 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 you know, they're all individually owned and they all have their own name in their company and run their companies the way they do, but they're all powered by the chorus of the international alliance. So it just, it allows them to be better, which ultimately gives more yeah, value. Yeah. What's, uh, uh, what, what, let me ask you about who's on the deal team. Like, you know, I got that $10 million company. It's 2 million e-bill. Who's on the deal team that, that, that's working on this. Yeah. So we bring about four to five people together uh, each time. So we've got our valuation person. That's going to start with the estimated value and dive into the numbers and really make sure that we're, 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 what we're seeing out in the marketplace matches up with your expectations. Then you're going to have the lead advisor, uh, whoever that is, one of the investment bankers, who's going to be responsible for running the deal, setting expectations, make, communicating. Um, when we put together the book, where, again, a lot of folks will have someone fill out a 20, 30, 40-page questionnaire and then just data entry it in to create the book. We have a copywriter. Um, she has her master's in journalism from Marquette University. She's been with me for 20 years. So of those three, 400 deals, she's written every single one of them. Copywriting can make you millions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So she, uh, so she's amazing. Because what we found is that people aren't, entrepreneurs aren't very good at writing up their story. They're really good at sharing the story and telling their story. So we sit down for a half a day and we can pull so much information out of those sellers as they tell their story and their growth opportunities and why they win. So it's, so we got the copywriter. We've got the MA advisor. We've got the evaluation person. We've got a sec. Typically, have a second M&A advisor, either myself or or someone else, as a backup. And then we have analysts that will do a lot of the research on the buy side of who are the right targets and right buyers. And then we have a uh, director of client uh, engagement and development that will oversee the whole deal. So there's four or five, six people that are touching that deal at at some point in time of you know getting all the information, dropping it in the. Dig- did the due diligence uh, data room, virtual data rooms, and things along that line. So, yeah, so if I if I sign you up, and you're the guy that found me, ten million dollar company, two million E. But uh, do I talk to you, or are you handing me off to uh, somebody junior, somebody else? Yeah, no, it depends. I mean, we've got guys that have thirty years experience, you know. So it it, it uh, we it would be what we look at is who's the best chance for success. So if you're manufacturing. We've got a couple of guys that really focus more on manufacturing than other guys have and have really good success. If you're construction, we've got one guy that's got 40 years of construction experience. So it's uh, not so exactly try- junior, right? No, yeah. no. It, it, we really try to match up. Uh, first, start with industry expertise. Who's worked in that space before? Then we look at uh, geographic area, you know, because we've got people here in Wisconsin. We've got people in Iowa, uh, Colorado, uh, North Dakota. You know, so where where is it located? And then we look at who's – Whose plate's full? Because a lot of groups will take on five, ten companies at per person, and I here to say, in my opinion, you can't handle more than four or five companies at one time if you really want to do a good job. Even with having that team around you, just because you need to be on. And we, so when we, we bring a team, you know, we hit it hard and move through the process. We want to control the process. So a lot of our deals are getting done in five to seven months versus the national average of 12 months or, or, you know, 11, 12 months. Yeah. What, what do you mean at any one time? Is that any one like four to five clients per kind of like per month or per year? No, per, per at one given time. So if I'm working on three clients, you know, you could be just signing on today. I could have another one that I've been market with. I could have another one that I've been due diligence with, but uh, so I, I, at any given time, I'm only working with three to five clients at one time. Yeah. Well, I agree with that. I do coaching clients where people are trying to buy a business and I just say, you know, I can only do two or three at a time. Right. Because otherwise you just spread yourself out too thin. And I don't care how good your process is. You don't have the time to do it. You're not going to take care of your client. Yeah. Well. Tell me about the broken deals. Because like not every bank executes on 100% of their transactions. Like how do, why do deals fall apart? You know, shortcomings, misaligned message, whatever it is, poor targeting. What does that look yeah. like? Yeah. A lot of times the most common reason is uh, the, uh, the business owner is checked out, they're burnt out, and they come to us and they're burnt out, but you don't see the results of that yet. But again, it takes five, six, seven, eight, nine months to sell a company. So during that process, they become more and more checked out, and all of a sudden the numbers start to do this, but they still want the number back here of where, where it used to be. So you know, we try to get to that's our that's why we try to educate more. And like I put together a you know a book and a workbook series that they can go through. And uh, oh, was that on uh, Amazon? 
It is. Yeah. yeah. Finish strong. You know, the book and the workbook, uh, sell your business on your terms. But it's it's one that uh, we try to we're trying to get to people early and early. So they plan because the reason businesses don't sell are two biggest reasons. Number one, they don't plan soon enough. Number two, they don't have a team around them that knows what they're doing. of specialists. So uh, but it, so I would say they're burnt out and their numbers start to decline. Uh, we just took one to market right now. We're having some. Uh, uh, that was one we, we've got a company that's doing uh, 50 million in sales, and but they were doing 35 million in sales and about 3 million in EBITDA. And now they're doing 55 million in sales, but they're only doing 3.5 million in EBITDA. So they're they're in the construction side of things. So 85 percent of their business was new construction, and their margins they got squeezed with all this inflation, where they they bid a job that was going to happen in six months or nine months, and the widget cost a dollar when they bid it, and now it now it's twice as much as yeah. And uh, so they're just getting killed. So their EBITDA margin used to be twelve percent. Now it's five. So no one's no one's going to touch it because they got a seventy million dollar backlog. And they're going, are you going to keep losing money or what? You know, when's this thing going to turn around? So we're probably just going to we actually hit the pause button and we're actually looking. Now he's found a couple opportunities that he could buy because there's other companies that are smaller than him in the construction world. You know, in the in the same space, in the mechanical contractor space that are getting squeezed. So he thinks we think we can switch over to the buy side, help them. Vertically integrate a little bit, geographically expand with a couple of horizontal acquisitions, and then go back in a year or two, and uh, he'll get a much better, much better offer and have a much broader audience. Yeah. How how do you value a company? There's a number of different methods, but I'm just curious about that story on Atlanta. You know, you had a couple offers from five million, and then you got one for eight million. How, what kind of valuation did you put on the company? What what did you tell him it was worth? Yeah. Yeah, we saw it right around five million. So for most businesses. Um, other than the ones that reoccurring, if you have reoccurring revenue, then you look at a multiple of revenue. Most don't. Most are, you know, uh, EBITDA driven or, or cash flow driven. So we're looking at that, you know, what is that normalized EBITDA after you, you know, put a salary in there, a reasonable salary in there for yourself and, and rent and add back any personal expenses and one-time costs and add that to, your, you know, your EBITDA number. And then it's, it's a multiple. You know, it used to be in normal times, you know, in the open market, a lot of them were three to five. Well, that's jumped up to four to six. You know, it's moved up, you know, kind of the rising tide lifts all boats. Four to so, six know. after what? In the middle, lower middle market? It, it, again, it, it it's, depends on the industry, the size and everything else. But, uh, you know, we just did the, uh, a distribution company that had 3.3 million in EBITDA. We sold it for a 7.5 times that that 3.3. So it was around a $24 million number. What was um, the top line revenue on that? I think around $20 million. 20 million. Uh, okay. Somewhere in that range. So they had good margins. You know, we were thinking it was around a $17 million number is what we saw out there for other companies. We ended up getting 40% more because just they you had so many people. buyers. Yeah. We had 14 yeah, multiple yeah, we, we, offers. <laughs> well, and that's, that's our goal. So our average used to be two to four. When we put together, we went to more of a team approach two years ago and we jumped up to six. Last year was nine offers per client and we're running somewhere in that. In that same range, so that's our goal is to not just bring a buyer to the table. We always say, you know, one buyer is no buyer. You you're never going to know truly what your business is worth until you package it up right, talk to all the right buyers, don't put an asking price out there, and then create this you know create this structure process of all the kind of hurting all the cats, getting them all to put offers in at one time. And that's what our our shirt suit sixty process that we've developed over the years does. How many of these companies that you engage with are just one, like a single manufacturing company? They just have one source of revenue or some are actually holding companies? Most of them are, are you know, husband, wife or family business, first time seller. And this has their, been their primary income for the last, you know, two, three decades. Yeah. Are you seeing more of the holding company kind of situations? Not too much. Um, in the lower middle market, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of our clients in that two to $50 million range, we've. We just, you know, maybe it's the referral sources that we have or, or you know, because a lot of our clients come through the CPA or the financial advisor. So they're used typically work with more of the privately held company with, you know, one, you know, one business, maybe two business units. Yeah. When you say CPA to financial advisor, I mean, are you, that's where you're doing your lead sourcing? You're reaching out to them saying. That's where a lot of our clients come from. The CPA who doesn't do M&A and go, hey, I've got this client. They want to sell. We don't know what to do. Can you help us come in and, and, and do that? So they'll do all the prep work. They'll do all the tax work. We'll come in. We'll do the valuation and then and then run our assurance for 65. I'm just curious. Are, are they crossing any legal, ethical uh, lines when they mention a client that's one of their clients that's looking to sell? Or... No, it's, it's with the approval of the client. You know, the oh, client okay. comes to them and said, hey, I want to sell. Who do you know? And then they'll recommend 
recommend us in. But a lot of our clients are uh, come through financial advisors because obviously they they're managing their money and yeah, I'm managing John, the business owner's money. I've got five hundred thousand dollars with him right now, but he's got a business worth twenty million dollars. Someday John's going to sell, and that's going to be my big windfall because if I manage, you know, if I get ten million of that, then it's you know at one percent uh, assets under management. It behooves right? them to find the yeah. best price. So so wealth managers are a good source of deal flow too. Yeah. yeah, because that's that's how they a lot of them build their business is they they'll wait for that business owner to sell and then they'll get a check for ten million that they can invest versus trying to find an individual at a half million dollars every pop. You know, it's twenty individuals versus just finding one client to take care of. Yeah, back to that construction company example where you kind of pull the market. Do you also help and advise somebody engages to use like, hey, look, pull the market, let's go build it. Obviously, you do this called finish strong. What what does the finish strong do? What are you, what are you telling them to do? Go acquire more companies or or, or what? Yeah, no, it's it's it, it's more just to clean up the business and, and help them figure out where they're going. So it's first of all just understanding when do they want to get out. Yeah, you know, most of them, most business owners just wake up one day and go, you know what, it's not fun anymore. I'm burnt out. I'm tired, or I had a health issue, or my spouse had a health issue. Time to get out. Well, they've done zero planning, and it's their largest asset. And you know, if you do no planning, you just want to go to market. It'd be like you know trying to sell your house. You haven't mowed the lawn in a month. The place is a mess. It stinks. There's food sitting all over, and you're gonna you're gonna try to sell your house. You know that's what that's what some people try to do. So we try to help them get the company ready. So it might be you know cleaning up their financials. You know looking at getting reviewed or audited statements the last two or three years versus just you know company financials are are, are compiled. It's working down their working capital. Most companies have are bloated with their working capital of how much you know inventory and receivables they have minus payable. So that's if they can work that down, that's money go, that goes into their pocket. It's building up their management team. You know, so many times the owner, you know, is the business. And, you know, and that's something that we try to really talk about is that just because John, the owner, is making $2 million doesn't mean that's going to transfer into value. Because if everybody calls John and John's the mastermind and John has everything in his head and John has all this with the clients and John does all the bidding. John's not get, replaceable. John's just, and then you're a bunch of worker bees. When John goes away, there's nothing left. Yeah. You know, unless John wants to stay for five years. And if John's going to stay for five years, John's probably just going to keep the company and bring in all, all the profits. So, um, so, you know, is the company truly transferable? So this goes through, you know, like a lot of books talk about value enhancement. We definitely hit on that, but it's more of a holistic approach of, like we talked about going back to that, what we call a three-legged stool is what is the realistic value? What's your net number? What's your lifestyle number? And knowing what those numbers are, because so many people just wake up and go, well, I hope, this will work. You know, I, I hope I have a good, uh, you know, retirement, but they have no idea what they're going to get for the value, what they need, what the tax numbers are. They most of them make way too much money of taxes on the table. So we go through all these steps. And then we look at it too, because most people, again, are going away from something. It's not fun. I'm tired and burnt out. Even a successful company, you know, these are not bad companies at all. These are all successful companies that we work with. We don't do turnarounds, um, but they don't know where they're going. So it's like, I, you know, I want to get away from this, but I spent zero time reflecting on where I want to go. So all of a sudden they get to that, I'm ready to sign on the dotted line, and they go, holy cow. Do I really want to do this? This is my baby. Do I really want to get my kid up for adoption, or was I just or, or, or was I just having a bad day? And some will pull back and, and, and blow the deal up, and others will do it and then be miserable. So we want to help them understand, you know, what's still on that bucket list? What do you want to be remembered for? You know, where's your life now when you look at it from a life wheel? You know, hey, business is great, but my kids don't talk to me. You know, or I'm, or I'm, you know, my second divorce and I'm overweight. Or you know, what? Is, you know, what's important to you in life? What are your goals? And, and that, that's what you focus on. Do you try to persuade them to come back to the table, or you just cut, still drive home the fact, like, well, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go with this? Like, yeah. So yeah. So in the workbook, this is something that we want them to fill this out before they ever think about going to market. Yeah. This is something that they can all contemplate with, and we go through it with them. Um, it helps them build out, you know, who's on their deal team, and and you know, and everything else. So there's just a lot of different things that we go to. You know, another one is big that we mentioned earlier is, uh, you know, what's important to you. So everybody talks about value, and that's the tip of the iceberg. But what about protecting the employees? What about the culture? What about you want to leave in three months, or you want to stick around for five years? You know, so we look at all these other things. So then we have them fill out a one through ten questionnaire of, you know, hey, these are, you know, these are all important items of what's the most important for you. And it was funny, I had the first time I had somebody fill it out, uh, I said, you know, put a one by the most important, a two by the second most important, and so on. 
He said to back, I had eight ones and two twos. I go, Bert, that's not what you need a one or two or three. <laughs> or you know, he goes, well, you didn't read the instructions very well, Bert. I, go, I know, but that's, and that's what it is. is people think it's easy, but sometimes it's not that easy to figure out if I had to choose, do I care about my name being on the sign after the sale or do I care about, you know, the legacy or, you know, what, or is it about me being out in six months because I'm tired or place a rating on that. That's kind of hard. That is hard. Yes. Yeah. So that's what we try to do is, is help them. And really a lot of times this is given the, the CPAs and financial advisors will buy the, the, the set and they give it to their clients to go through and they can kind of walk them through it a little bit. And we coach them through if they have any questions. But it's, it just gives them a good idea, and then we can, and then we do the essence of value for them to help them understand that base level, because most business owners, I think, you know, there's studies out there that less than 15 percent of business owners have had a, a, a true valuation done in the last two two to three years. Yeah. Think about that. You know, it's you know whatever your house is worth, the cottage, the cars, the boats, but your biggest asset that's worth 80, 90 percent of your overhead net worth, you're just guessing. Yeah. And people usually don't guess right. They usually guess high. And it's usually, usually you know, guess high. Yes. Yeah, that's the, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about if a business, so like I got a $10 million business, 2 million EBITDA, and I'm using it as my personal bank account legally. Like, yeah. how do you get yeah. that into shape with a, the, the seller? I'm like, maybe I'm taking, it's really profitable. I'm taking, you know, a million dollars out or 2 million. Yeah. Yep. No, we, we, we see that all the time. I've had, I've had boats, every boats, planes. I've had everything but a train uh, that I that I've seen in a company. But so what we'll do is two things. One is what we'll do is we'll recast those numbers back. So we'll say, okay, it's got to be on paper. You got to be able to track it in your P and L. What you know, where are those personal expenses? The country club, the cars, the you know, whatever else it is. Um, and we'll we'll make those adjustments for the buyer to review and with footnotes and everything else. But ideally, do that all your life for thirty years. But the last two to three years, don't do that. And yeah, you're going to take a tax hit, but you know, paying 30% or whatever you're going to pay in taxes, for every dollar that can easily drop to the bottom line, you're going to get a four, five, six, seven, eight times multiple on that dollar. So the idea would be the last year or two or three before you go, you go to sell is you stop treating this as your own personal bank account and just let everything drop to the bottom line, pay the extra taxes, but you're going to get a better value. Um, what we end up doing typically is making those adjustments and then it's up to the buyer that they are going to, we try to make them as credible as possible so they, they can buy into them. And most times they will buy into it, but not, you know, not always. And sometimes there's, there's money that they leave on the that table. Sounds like you got to get to them pretty early. If you're telling them like, you know, you got a three year window, to start dropping this to the bottom line, put that back into the uh, cash flow to drop to the bottom line. Yeah. In an ideal world. Yeah. Three to five years. I mean, sooner the better 10 years, but you know, three to five years would be the ideal. I can tell you probably 80, 90% of the time, it's, hey, I talked to my ex, they, you know, about selling my business last month or last week or yesterday. They gave me your name. I want to sit down and talk to you. You know, what's the next step? And they're ready to go. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Let me ask you about that. You know, there's you know, top 10 reasons why people sell their company. And you talked about three of them. They're just tired, want to get off the merry go around. Is there any that create a big, bigger mess like partner problems or divorce? Something like that you just like, hey man, let's not touch this because it's just too going to be too messy. Yeah, I mean, if you've got partner issues or there's a lawsuit in play, you know, nobody wants to put, you know, buy something out where there's a lawsuit hanging out there, especially between two partners or, you know, especially if you're both needed in the business. You know, if, they, if you got a partner that's disgruntled but they're absentee, they're kind of maybe they they bank the thing to start, and you're you're going to partner with the person who's running it, and you just want to get the absentee angry owner out. That could work, but if you've got partner issues that are both in the business you're going to have cultural issues you're going to have it you don't know what's pandora's box is going to be that's going to just gonna make it harder to sell even if yeah. they're 30 percent owner yeah yeah right yeah so you want to clean that up you know we always say you know goggly early so if there's an issue with the business you know hr or margin or you know a customer just left or a good employee just left we always put that right in the sim or in the book up front because everybody's like, oh, you know, I don't want people to know that right away. You know, maybe we'll tell them later or hopefully they won't find it. Well, number one, they are going to find it. There's so much diligence done on these companies because they are paying these premiums. The buyer will find whatever you're trying to hide. And if you do that, it can blow the whole deal because all of a sudden now you're building all this credibility and this rapport together with a buyer and seller. And all of a sudden they flipped up the cards and go, hey, you didn't tell me about that. Oh, well, yeah, I was going to tell you about that. Well, when? Uh, later. You know, it's like, do I really want to, especially if you're rolling equity with a private equity firm, do I, 
do I want this person owning 20% of my company or, or still running the company? So, and that's where the retrades come in a lot of times, uh, or they just, you know, the deal will just blow up because. Yeah. You know, what about so, divorce? Is that uh, an opportunity or is that something you. Uh... you no, know, any uncertainty is bad. You know, anytime there's uncertainty, uh, you know, so it's, Hey, do you just want to get through the divorce first and then go to market and, and, uh, um, or at least you have that worked out that if, you know, the husband or wife owns any shares, you know, who's not in the business, have they agreed in writing that they'll sell and they're not going to hold things up at a certain value or above, or, you know, you don't want, you know, the worst is when you have someone not in the business or, you know, you see it that they don't write up their, uh, their buy sell agreements, right. And you've got somebody who's got a 2% ownership that all of a sudden now is, and that maybe that's the manager. And we've seen this, we did a deal probably a year and a half ago where there was two owners but absentee now because they had built the company up and they took their two top managers and gave them both two and a half percent. So the two owners went from 50, 50 to 47, five and a half, and then two and a half for each of them. They can give it to them for free as a thank you for running the business, even though they're still paying them well. And the business is doing great. But at the end of the day, all of a sudden they felt that they now were owners that they could control the business because the two other majority owners were absentee and hey, we want to do this. Well, we don't think you should do that. Well, if you don't want to do that, then we're going to leave and you're out of here and you're screwed. So all of a sudden now the dog was wagging the tail. So you really got to be careful. And in the sale process, they were they were trying to hold up the deal. And they this is how could weird. they? Did they have voting rights? They had voting rights. Yep. Okay. And uh you know, so it was just it was a it was one of these things that the yeah, we're all friends, it all work itself out. We don't need to put all this stuff in writing. And money when, changes everything. Tell me that. Back, it bites you. Yeah. So they were trying to buy them out. The partner was trying to the one main partner and the other two small people were trying to buy out the other partner for like they started like a I don't know, a six, seven million dollar valuation or total. Then they went up to like nine. And we thought we could get 13 and a half. And then the other majority partners like, hey, if you get 13 and a half, we're in. Well, they had a, this was during COVID. So they had a COVID bump. Uh, they did really well. We ended up getting 25 million for the company. Holy crap. So yeah. So, all problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. So everybody was happy after, after that point, but it, but they almost blew the deal up. But there was one buyer that was a good buyer that they, after they met the two managing owners said, I can't work with these people. I'm going to, I'm pulling my offer off the table. You know, so you want to make sure that these people, especially if they're owners, you're all on the same page. You know who controls, you know, when you get to that sale, that they can't hold you back or, or that they're, you know. Yeah, yeah, have, that's a, they, they can't have that. They're excited and they're going to help with the sale versus deter the sale because they don't know what this new owner is going to bring and they're worried about change and things like that. So having the ownership team on board and the management team, you know, again, you want to keep things confidential, but at some point in time, in many cases, you have to tell at least your top couple, you know, management people because the buyers are going to want to meet them at some point, anyways. But if they can, if they can show well and they're excited for the sale and this new opportunity, because usually with a new buyer comes with new opportunities, and now they're selling the company versus the owner who just wants to cash out, that will definitely help in, in bringing more people, getting more people excited because now these people are going to stay. They're a proven commodity and they're excited about the future. I, I want to back. Yeah, you know, people back people more than they back up a product or a service. Yeah, yeah. You know, back, back I, back. I, I'm almost on the hour because that went by fast. Couple questions, last questions. Does this where you're sitting require a license to do it? A, a security license? Best. Yeah, so it, it, it's 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 a great area. Uh, it, it's there's not a, a perfect fit for mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so, and in, in I think in like 17 or 18 states, you have to have your real estate license to sell a business, even if you're not selling real estate, which again doesn't fit or make sense, but that's, you know, Wisconsin, you have to have a real estate license to sell a business. And then also if a business is deemed a securities, which, you know, if there's a seller note or if it's a stock deal or it's bought by a public company, then technically you should have your FINRA uh, series 79 license. Or, Versus an asset purchase as a stock purchase. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I have my FINRA licensee, my 62 and 63, which is, which was before the 79 came out and grandfathered in. And then, uh, and then we have our real estate a broker's license here, but in some states, you don't need any license at all. You know, or or, or most people, probably ninety five percent of people, do not have their their FINRA ser you know series licenses because there's a no action letter that was out there for a long time. So it's there's a lot we're we're trying to pass a law and trying to lobby uh, Congress in, in, in for ten, 10 years now to try to get a, a a law that specifically holds us accountable for what we do. You know, because it's 
the security stuff is for someone that's taking money and managing money. We don't touch anybody's money. Um, and then the real estate is for real estate. So we're, when I do continuing education, I'm learning about lead paint on houses, you know, which has nothing to do with what we do in selling a company. So that's hopefully something that will we'll get resolved. There's some bills that have gotten close, but uh, nothing's passed yet. All right. So last thing, well, what are those two books again? And do they come together on Amazon? They don't. They don't let you bundle. So it's uh, core, uh, Finish Strong, the workbook, and yep. then uh, and Finish Strong, Sell Your Business on Your Terms. All right. So, Scott Bushke, thanks for being a guest on Top m and Entrepreneurs. And if you like this content, make sure you subscribe below. Sounds good. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for watching this video. Make sure you're a subscriber by clicking on this button right here down below. And if you want to watch more Serial Acquire interviews, click on this button right here. If you're ready to buy your first business, get my course at dealflowsystem.net right here. Take care. Cheers, John.